Hello gamers, welcome to a preview of Aberration. This is a preview of Aberration and there is a lot to tell you about this game. Goodness, where am I going to put the box? Great. I am Professor Meg, welcome back to the Board Game Code channel, and this is a preview of Aberration. Please keep in mind this is a paid preview and all components are subject to change. This is a demo copy, however it will give you a great feel of the game, uh, but some of this will definitely change, such as miniature quality and things like that. Now. Aberration comes to you from Ghostfire Gaming. Ghostfire Gaming is known for their RPG system, Grim Hollow. Uh, so they took that entire world and made a board game based in that world. So you'll see different things, like different types of uh, people that you can be. So there are humans, there are disembodied, and there are a whole other bunch of options. And then you're also playing as different roles, such as the martial artist and the captain. You'll be able to mix and match those, and it's very thematic with what their RPG world is. Um, so just know that ahead of time that if you enjoy this world and the lore, there is so much more for you to discover. Uh, another thing to note is that this game design is brought to you by Peter Lee. He is known for games like Lords of Waterdeep, uh, so you may be familiar with him, but and games like Horrified. Uh, so I uh, just know that before we jump into this. Aberration is a cooperative bag building tower defense game where players are going to be working together with their asymmetric powers using their bag building to activate different abilities all while protecting the village center from different monsters and trying to prevent as much fear as possible. One of my favorite things about Aberration is the bag building aspect and how you use your player board. So I'm going to go over what that looks like first because I think it was really unique and a lot of fun. And then we'll get into what the tower defense looks like and how you're using those powers to protect everybody, basically. Uh, so in your ability board, you have different abilities and tokens that are covering them. So you have intellect, strength, speed, and command, and they're all being covered by these different tokens. Now every player starts the game with a bag, and they'll also have starting ability chips. So the Ithril, the disembodied, starts with a white, which is a heroic action. That means it can be used as a wild for anything you want. He also starts with a blue, yellow, and black. Now black, again, is not one of these four abilities. A black is an aberration token instead. This one can only be used for a certain ability that can be used with any chip type, but if you use this one, your aberration track will go up. Your aberration track is right here, where you would have a cube, and you would start at the beginning, and every time you use it, you would move up on this track. Once it hits the top, you'll gain an aberration card. Now an aberration card is how players are getting more and more affected by the magic that is in the world and it is both powering them up but also hurting them because when the fourth aberration card is drawn the players will lose the game. There are other ways to lose the game but that would happen. Now, an aberration card looks like this, so it says mind control. Now, for a black chip, you can move one shadow in any direction, so it gives you an additional ability that you can use for your black chips, but it gives you a flaw, which this one is gain of fear. Now, fear is cumulative for everybody, and it's tracked on this board as well as survival. Now, if your fear ever reaches the end, you will be defeated, but if your survival reaches the end, you will have victory. So you are racing to reach survival before your fear catches up with you, and this would be something that would have you gain additional fear, but you have a power added to your character. Now, every turn, players will be drawing from their bag tokens. Um, you'll be drawing them up to your intellect level. So you can see for this character, their intellect level is three, but for this character over here, it's a four. Sorry this character's board is cut off. I wanted to show you as much as possible. Also, please keep in mind that this is a full sphere. It is only cut off by my camera to be able to show you as much as possible, um, but this is a round map for sure, and it would have the north arrow up above on this uh, quadrant. So players will draw from their bag the number of their intellect, say for example mine was 3, and then I would use those colors to be able to activate different abilities. Now I have this set up in the middle of a game, so there are quite a few out that are in the discard pile. Once you use them, they go to your discard and they don't go back into the bag until all of the tokens have been pulled out of your bag and you would need to pull a new one. 
So you can see here I have a bit of my discard and things that I have used. Um, and here are the abilities that you'll be activating. So, for example, this character is a martial artist, and for a blue chip, they have a scorpion jab, which is make a melee attack by rolling two dice. If it deals damage, freeze the enemy. Now, this is an example to show you how the dice work for certain types of attacks that you'll be doing. I would roll two dice. That's not great, um, so I would miss completely. However, if I had rolled this side, it would be a hit, and if I rolled this side, it would be a graze. A graze is almost always a hit, however, my martial artist has this ability, which I think was absolutely great. Uh, it's a passive ability that you can unlock where grazes miss you, so for that character it would need to be a hit. Now their red ability uh, for a red chip, they could make a melee attack dealing their strength damage. So this is an example where they wouldn't be rolling dice. They would be rolling, they would just be doing the amount of damage based on their ability board. So they would do one damage based on their strength. However, this character also has flying kick for a green chip. And that would move up to your speed and then make a melee attack rolling speed dice. So for this one, I would be able to roll four dice. I'm still rolling, but that is a lot better of an option that I could potentially do four damage. Now something else that players are able to do is that they start the game with an experience point and you also gain one at the end of every round. There are these great little purple stars and you can use them for two different types of things. One of them is to unlock those special abilities that I mentioned such as Graze is Missing Me. Um, so you can use those to unlock here. Another one that I'm able to unlock is make a melee attack dealing speed damage. So that's one where I would just deal the automatic four damage instead of needing to roll any dice. Now, to be able to remove these chips from your ability board, it would start completely full, um, you know, with all of these in place, and you would need to spend different experience points to be able to unlock these chips. So for one experience point, you're able to unlock a chip, add it to your discard pool, and then later you'll add it into your bag to be drawn in the future. Chips will cost more and more to unlock, but this is a way that you can either spread out the different types of abilities you want to be doing or specialize within a certain path within the course of the game. A few other things that players can do is hold one chip for the next round, which can be very useful, especially if you draw your heroic chip, which is a free action, or if you don't really have something that's useful, as if like you can't move somewhere to use a melee attack, you can hold that melee attack for later. So that's something that you're able to do, and every character with their race will get a certain ability. So your special abilities, for example, with my disembodied person was ghostly form. At the start of your turn, you may teleport to the space you can see. So every one of these characters will have a special ability that you're able to do, and you're able to mix and match that with the different specialties. So I don't need to be a disembodied martial artist. I could be a human martial artist, etc., and mix and match these in different ways to find the combinations that you enjoy. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this tower and what you're defending. So you are playing on this circular board that is broken up into four quadrants. You have your north, east, south, and west, and some things will be determined by those different directions, so that can be very helpful. Um, but there are monsters that you'll be fighting on the board. When they reach the village center, your fear will go up. However, there will also be these influence tokens that you are also combating against. So these influence tokens represent corruption that is happening where you are no longer able to reach this space on the board. Now, if an influence token were to spawn here, it would feel like this, and it would then make this vantage point no longer accessible. It would become corrupted and you would gain a fear for this spot becoming a corrupted spot. You can see that in this game, this spot did become corrupted and it is no longer accessible to the players. Now players are trying to reach these vantage points and spend their chips, similar to using their abilities, to unlock the vantage points. You're trying to activate them to get certain rewards, and then after that you're able to flip it over to gain an ability. Then once you're able to use this vantage point, which this one is an in, you'll be able to heal and have a villager attack. So it becomes very useful and it's also a win condition for the game, but all of them will have different activation costs. You can see that this one was two red chips, this one was a blue and two green, etc. So you'll be trying to meet different objectives moving all around the map. Another thing to note is that every square is one spot, but these little trails between the different quadrants are also one step for you to go from one side of the board to the other. 
Now there are flames, uh, there are fires that you can set that are very helpful. They let you see monsters, which are shadows, until they get close enough to be flipped over and then you know what they are. And they also prevent influence from being spawned on that spot. So if there was a flame here and then you were to spawn an influence, instead they would both be removed and that spot would still be safe. Now there may be reasons to do that, such as you want to unlock that vantage point. So there's definitely a strategic way to be choosing when you want to do that in the game. Now, as I said, monsters will spawn as shadows. So first you'll see that there are just a certain number of monsters coming toward you, but once they get close enough, they are revealed, and that will be determined by the number that's on the token. So this one is a one, and it will also have the ability in sight. You can see over here, that all of our monsters are in these piles. So I kind of have the miniatures over it just to kind of show these off. Um, this is a Caprathorn. It's very cool. Uh, I think that these monsters are very unique and very, very fun. Here is a bear, uh, but that's not a normal bear. That's a very scary bear. Um, and this is also a wolf, but he's kind of like a two-faced wolf. I think the better way to show you for the wolf is his card. But that's very, very spooky. So our monsters are all over here, and they will all have different things that they will be operating on throughout the board. Um, so they will all be using the same card per creature, but there are definitely times where you have more than one of the same creature on the board. In fact, you will have many, and this board may seem overrun at times where you will think you will not survive whatsoever. Um, but you can see here that there is a monster attack, health, and then any effects. So he will attack for three when he attacks players, his health is three when you need to be dealing damage to him, and he has stealthy. Other monsters will have different abilities, such as flying, which means that you'll be able to reach them to hit them, and this enemy has regenerate, which means that they will heal at the end of the turn. Now, when monsters are attacking you when you are taking damage, you will also be taking it on your aberration track. So if you were to take the three damage, you would go one, two, three, gain an aberration card, go back to the start, and then you likely would have gained a fear. So that's something that you're managing together as a team, the fear that is growing throughout the entire world, and you are just becoming more and more corrupted a bit with the aberration that is happening to you and you're able to use those aberration chips with more and more special abilities while things are getting more and more scary. Now the way that the monsters are going to work is that they're going to have this great beast deck over here. So you will be flipping a card over and this will tell you which monster will level up. So this is the fourth monster and the bear is currently at level three. Now because that number is there, we'll move that to the bottom and he will become level 4. You can see that his health is a bit stronger now. He now has armor. Um, but then you will see that each hero with two or fewer transformation cards puts an aberration, in their dis an aberration token in their discard pool. Then you will spawn three shadows starting with the southernmost board. So you would then place three more monsters out and this will happen every turn that you will gain more and more monsters to fight throughout the game and it will be a free-for-all when you're trying to fight the monsters, trying to stop the influence from being started, trying to activate the different vantage points and get those secured, and there's also a final aspect where you are able to do a worker placement type action. Now the yellow token allows you to command these meeples. The meeples work in the village center, and they're able to do different things. Now from these different towers, they're able to attack, so they can fight monsters for you and make different attacks, rolling dice based on your command level, and there are also different actions that they can do throughout the board. There is Fortify, which is you can secure a vantage point by paying its listed cost. So normally you would need to be next to the vantage point to be able to secure it, but you can use Fortify to be able to do it automatically. You can also light a fire. You can scout, which will let you see the shadows of the monsters. And you're able to go to the shopkeeper, which will let you draw items. Now items are the final thing that I haven't really gone over, but you will have items in your hand that will do different things. For example, this is a potion of renewal. One player returns up to three ability chips in their discard pool to their bag. Um, that's really great when your bag is getting kind of empty because then you can kind of control what chips are in that bag. 
but there's a strip at the bottom that says alter change and abilities chip color so you can always use these bottom abilities to do different things or the item for what the card is so for another example this is spiked stimulant and the, again this is a prototype so that's why there's no art here yet but you can put an aberration token in your discard pool and then draw three ability chips but it can also be used so that the current player can draw one ability chip other things that can be used at the bottom can be to reroll any dice, prevent one damage, etc. That is kind of a balance of what you use your items for and when you use them for their ability versus the additional benefit that they gain on the bottom. On top of all that, players are also working towards objectives. These objectives, again, are cooperative, so you can be doing them together, but you can complete objectives to also gain survival points to win the game. So the objectives will be over here, and they'll have you doing different things, such as gear up, unlock special abilities, either locked class abilities or attuned items, and then the number of players determines how many you need to do. So for example, two players, you need to unlock two special abilities, and where my character has already unlocked the two, it would be achieved right away. This would give you a victory point here for survival, and you'll be closer and closer to winning the game in that way as well. Overall, the pace of play is fairly quick and I felt the rules were pretty easy to understand. It is a very deep world with a lot of lore, the enemies definitely scare me, and there was a sense of being overwhelmed by a lot of miniatures on the board, a lot of monsters moving toward the village center and feeling like you aren't able to stop it. But it was definitely manageable and in the end we were able to win. So where it is difficult and challenging, it wasn't too much that I think it gave the appropriate amount of feeling like you're not going to make it out alive, but then you do. I also think as far as the complexity of choices in the game, where you have a lot you can build out with your character, you're making those choices turn by turn where you're getting more and more familiar with the abilities that you are favoring and it helps you learn your character and your ability can definitely be quite useful. Where I feel like there are a lot of choices in this game, I feel like turn by turn it's not too complicated. You're kind of determined by the chips that you draw and what actions you're able to do, and the complexity comes in what you choose to unlock and what type of character you want your character to be and what abilities you choose to pay into. As I said, the enemies are definitely very scary. We have the Great Beast's turn, which is the one that's kind of dictating all of our monsters and what they are doing. They definitely tend to spawn everywhere and where only certain characters can fight certain ones, such as the bats that are flying, it can definitely become pretty scary quickly. One final thing I'll note is that gaining one experience at the end of every turn is how you end up unlocking your different tokens, but it also feels very rewarding and quick paced that you're getting an experience every single turn, you're able to unlock a token every turn, so it does feel very rewarding in that sense. Now I do say that, but abilities will cost you more and more the further you go up, but there will be other opportunities to be awarded additional experience points, such as with certain cards or enemies. Now one thing to keep in mind is that this is based on an RPG system, so both the races and the classes are both very fleshed out and fun to play with, and they're all very unique, so you'll be able to mix and match those and play different combinations and find out what you enjoy, and play with different thematic things as well when you're making up your teams. One final thing to note, especially with that customization, is that where your races determine your starting ability chips, such as the disembodied starts with the heroic chip, a blue, a yellow, and a black, the human, however, starts with their heroic chip, a aberration chip, and then two of any color they like. So they can choose anything they would want, which is very typical for something like a human class, but there is that depth to the game that you're able to really customize and find the combinations that are fun and able to overcome the different challenges that are presented to you in the game. This has been a preview of Aberration. Reminder, this is from Ghostfire Gaming, based on Grim Hollow and designed by Peter Lee. This will be on GameFound on September 26th. You can check out the link below for their pre-launch page, and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you later. Bye!